Well, on a very basic level, people who are from Detroit simply don't like to get pushed around, I guess. And and I got tired of listening to the rhetoric surrounding the the investigation or the alleged alleged investigation into the Oakland County child killings. Um, there there are two possible reasons this case was never officially closed, and I, I don't I don't believe in the first one, which which is that the incompetence of the investigation uh, led to it remaining open for four, over four decades now. The other, the other reason this case was never officially closed was that it was not meant to be closed. And, and I could tell from, from very early on listening to the news stories about this case and doing some initial reading, there were certain people in, in positions of power who didn't want this thing sh- shut because to shut the case means you have to come up with a, a conclusion. And But on a very personal level, this case anchored in me very early on uh, because when I was a kid, somebody tried to snatch me while I was walking home from the Century Drugs that, that used to be at uh, Evergreen Plaza, they called it, over at 11 Mile and Evergreen in Southfield, which is outside of Detroit. Nothing happened. Somebody I thought was a security guard had followed me out of the store, gotten into his car, followed me for three blocks, and and then later tried to get me into that car. I ran away. I never told anybody. And as an adult, um, I started thinking of of the time period in which this attempted snatch uh, of me happened. And and it was the same time period in which the uh, Oakland County child killings were occurring, 76, 77. And uh, the same MO, uh, people thought, uh, snatching kids from outside little strip malls. They speculated that it was uh, somebody acting as in a position of power, like a security guard or police officer. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and I'm very lucky to have this guy with me because lately he's not been sleeping in the garage. He's been at a week-long RV party hosted by Baker Mayfield. Ladies and gentlemen, the captain. The Browns are so desperate, they offered me a contract. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Tonight we are drinking Scotty Karate Scotch Ale by the brilliant team of brewers up at Dark Horse Brewing in Marshall, Michigan. Right. Garage grade four out of five bottle caps. This is a big, bold beer. Brewed right. with cherry wood smoked malt, offering up warming notes of coffee and sweet caramelized brown sugar. Scotty Karate finishes earthy, giving this beer a character all its own. And this fantastic beer comes to us from our good friends. First up, we have Holly in Fredericktown, Ohio, and Lindsay in Salem, Ohio. And a big shout out to Julie, which says that she's an Ohio girl at heart. And a cheers to Amy from Indianapolis, Indiana. And a big cheers to Craig from Santiago. Here's a big cheers to Penny and a little cheers to Beckett Lamlu in Flushing, New York. And last but not least, a cheers to Jessica all the way in Gothenburg, Sweden. So if you'd like to help us fill up the fridge, check out our website, truecrimegarage.com, and click on the donate banner. And if you'd like to show your support for True Crime Garage, go to our website, check out the store page. We have shirts, we have coffee mugs, beer glasses, tumblers, just about anything you can think of, all at truecrimegarage.com. That is enough of the business. Everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. P. 
People from Michigan often describe their state as a mitten. They hold up their right hand and point to where they live on their palm. In regards to this week's case, they would show you the location of Oakland County by pointing to the base of their thumb. Sounds odd, but ask anyone from Michigan and the hand will come up. Oakland County is near Detroit. In the 1970s, it was a county that had very high-paid executives, as well as many middle-class blue-collar workers. This combination provided both great schools and a safe environment. But Oakland County is not famous for the schools or the industry. It is infamous for the serial killer who found his prey there. This week, we are talking about the case of the Oakland County child killer. It is a 40-year-old unsolved mystery, where in 1976 and 77, children were abducted and held for days. Then, they were murdered and staged. The killer stole these kids off the streets before holding them captive. He fed them and took care of their physical needs, while at the same time, torturing them. The bodies were not tossed out or dumped like garbage. The killer cleaned them and placed them in public places. The bodies were easy to find, but the killer was not. What happened to him? Some have speculated that the killer committed suicide, taking his secrets to the grave. Some believe that just like the boogeyman, he terrified us and vanished back into the shadows. Years later, people began to wonder... Was this the work of something bigger, something even more sinister than a lone killer? Mark Stebbins lived in Ferndale, Michigan, one of the many hamlets inside Oakland County. Ferndale is primarily residential with a smaller commercial and industrial sector in the southeast part of the city. Ferndale's business district is anchored by the intersection of Woodward Avenue and Nine Mile Road, where privately owned storefronts, dance clubs, bars, and numerous restaurants are featured. In the 1970s, the Ferndale suburb community emerged as a place for families to raise children during the baby boom era. With its elementary schools, a downtown, city parks, active churches, and civic groups. It was a small town, just like the other towns where these victims lived peacefully up until the day that they were taken. Mark was born September 13th, 1963. Now in 1976, Mark was a 7th grader at Lincoln Junior High. He lived with his mother after his parents split up when he was just 5 years old. Besides his mother, Mark lived with his older brother Michael. Mark was an average 12-year-old boy in just about every way. He was 4 foot 8 inches tall and weighed about 100 pounds. But life was about to change for everyone in Oakland County. Yeah, this is going to be Sunday, February 15th, nineteen. 76. This would turn out to be a rainy day, but it was quite warm for the season. Mark's mother, Ruth, wanted to attend a work party at the American Legion Hall. So Mark, his brother Michael, Ruth, and her boyfriend drove the three blocks to the hall. When they arrived, there was a pool tournament in progress, but watching adults drink and play pool only entertains a 12-year-old boy for so long. So Mark, before the party was over, asked his mother If he could head home, he wanted to go home and watch television. His mom was hesitant, but she did allow Mark to leave alone. Mark then asked her for a quarter so he could buy some ice cream at the store next door to the American Legion. His mom reminded him that he had just received his allowance and said no. Now, his brother offered to go along with him, but Mark, he was 12, and he said he would be fine by himself. At 12.25 p.m., Mark Stebbins walked out of the hall alone. Now, Sometime in the 7 p.m. hour, Ruth tried to call Mark at home, but there was no answer. This did not raise any alarms and probably shouldn't have. But she, So she's not worried, and she continued to enjoy the party. 
At 9 o'clock, she returned to an empty house. Now, this put her on edge a bit, but she figured she would wait one more hour to see if Mark would come home. He did not, and at 10 o'clock, Ruth called the police and reported him as missing. The police responded to the Stebbins house, not expecting anything more than a runaway or a kid who lost track of time. The police informed her, we haven't had any kidnappings in Ferndale in 10 years. But nonetheless, the search for the 12-year-old boy began. They searched abandoned buildings and other stops popular with the kids. But nothing turned up and he never came back. And then the hours turned to days. The walk from the American Legion to Mark's house was only three blocks. What could he have encountered on such a short walk home? Unfortunately, four days later, they're going to find his body. Yeah, this is on Thursday, February 19th at approximately 1140 a.m. when a man is out picking up lunch from the Fairfax Plaza office building. He spotted a body lying on a pile of leaves near the building's dumpster. The man found Mark Stebbins' body curled on a snowbank in the fetal position. It appeared that the body was placed there gently. The odd thing here, Captain, this is not a secluded location. It is and was an active office building with people coming and going all day long. Right, so the perpetrator could have been seen by anybody. Yeah, this killer was bold enough to remove Mark from whatever kind of vehicle he was driving and place the body in a location where he, the killer, could have been easily spotted or at least his vehicle seen by somebody. Well, and the extra time that he's going to be taking to place the body in a certain position. This spot is only two and a half miles from Mark's house. But even in that short distance, we have a different police jurisdiction. So the victim, Mark, lived in Ferndale, but his body was found in Southfield. This is another town in Oakland County. And one has to wonder if this is done on purpose. Yeah. Would the killer have been aware of this? Uh, Did he place Mark there knowing that it would involve another police department. So the Southfield police arrived to find Mark. The scene was like no other. Upon the first review of Mark, there were several things that jumped out at the officers. Mark appeared to be clean. Mark was wearing the clothes he had on the day he disappeared. His jacket was zipped up, and his hood was pulled over his head. The Southfield police radioed in the information that they had found the boy's body. This quickly got back to Ferndale police and they realized that their missing persons case just became a murder investigation. The Ferndale police showed up at the office building and started to process the scene. This is hard to believe knowing today's practices, but remember we have two different police departments working this one crime scene. Well, and remember, it's the late 70s. I mean, doctors used to smoke in the hospital. Well, and in in this area too, Captain, neither of these police jurisdictions, neither of these departments uh, had much experience in murder cases. So rather than process the scene, believe it or not, the Southfield police removed Mark's body. This is just wrong, of course, but they take the body to the police station, not to the morgue, to the police station. Then they decide to remove Mark's clothes at the police station. Mm -hmm. Then after sending the body to the morgue, they go back and processed the scene back at the dump site. They decide to involve a local psychiatrist. This is Bruce Danto. He was brought to the scene to create a profile of this killer, but he had a better idea or at least a better idea (laughs) that he thought to him. Yes. Yes. So he suggested that they place a life-sized child's mannequin wearing similar clothes as Mark in the same spot. So let's stop here and review, shall we? Well, first of all, what the hell does it have to do with profiling the perpetrator? Well, he's brought into profile, and I think what he thought was, let's see if we can get the killer to return to the scene, and we'll just arrest him on the spot, and I, we won't need to come up with any profile. So I know that this whole thing sounds like a very weird technique, but it's not unique. It's not a unique technique. So let me just see if I'm hearing you right. Okay. So the idea from this doctor is that we're going to take this mannequin and we're going to place him in similar clothes or the same clothes. No, similar clothes. Similar clothes. And we're going to put him in the similar position and it's kind of out in the open. We know that sometimes killers will go back Mm -hmm. to where they dump victims to kind of see 
has the victim been found yet? So their idea is that the the suspect will come back, mm-hmm. and when he comes back, we'll arrest him on the spot. Correct. Okay. And and like I said, though, it, it sounds weird, but it's not a technique that was unique. And I mean that for the time period. I don't know that they would do something like this today, or I can't find anything recent where they did something like this today. But we know that in the Michigan murders, in the case it's often referred to as the Michigan murders, they used this technique. They've used it in the Green River Killer case as well as the Atlanta child murders. Right. Now, question. Would you sign up for this special duty? Because that's what they'd call it. They'd have special duty where police officers would have to wait in their vehicle somewhere mm-hmm. looking for the suspect to return. Of would, course. Of okay. course. So, like in the... You in, get the donuts, I'll get the coffee. But here's the reason why I think that he decided to do this, or at least suggested it, was because the Michigan murders took place in 1967 through 1969. Right. And that was when Ann Arbor brought in a man named Peter Herkos to assist... He had, he had assisted in the Boston Strangler case. So they brought this dude in and say, look, we got a serial killer and we need to try some things to try to figure out who this guy is. Now, I don't recall for certain whose idea it was, but it was likely Herkos's idea that they employed this technique in the Michigan murders. The idea, as you said, that the killer would return to the bodies. Um, I'm guessing, my guess here, Captain, and I would be willing to wager a $100 bill bill and six-pack of beer, Mm -hmm. that Danto, the guy brought in on the Oakland County case on Mark Stebbins' murder, had studied the Michigan murders case and was taking a tactic from that. And whether or not you think this is a genius idea or a dumbass idea, what could it hurt, really, right? Well, other than destroying the crime scene... It doesn't hurt much. Well, but if you process the crime scene properly uh, in advance, right? But here's the problem with it, with using this technique uh, or tactic in this particular case. So the main, there's two main reasons why the killer will return to the body. The first being in, and actually most of the time it being sexual for sexual reasons, the killer will return to the body. There's also investigative where the killer wants to see why, Nobody's found the body. Right. The problem with this situation is this situation is unique in that most of the times when the, in fact, the, the investigations that we just discussed, the Michigan murders, the green river killer, the Atlanta child murders, and there's more, but the bodies that they were returning to were secluded. They were in the woods. They were hidden. This, this body is left out in the open. So returning to the body for sexual reasons means you're going to have to, bring the pick up the body and take it with you. Mm -hmm. You know, it seems unlikely that a killer would dump the body in a very public open location, not secluded, and then choose to return to it. Yeah. And you gotta be pretty brazen to return to open area and then drop trial. And it almost seems usually when a killer will leave a body in a very public place like this, that psychologically, for some reason, it's almost a sign of, of that maybe they want the body to be found sooner rather than later mm-hmm. for some some sure. unknown reason. Yeah, you wonder if that is um, kind of a control thing, like I'm letting you find the body. Well, we could go through our thoughts on the actual crime scene, but the general report is simple. They just took a crime scene that, that they could have produced something and they destroyed it. So footprints, fingerprints, and fibers were destroyed. Mm -hmm. They had nothing, and we will get back to this in a minute. The medical examiner's findings were as follows. Mark had been alive, well-fed, and cared for during the time he was missing, about four days, presumably, by his killer or someone involved. We say cared for, for a lack of better term. Someone who is kidnapped and later killed is never really cared for, by the perpetrator. Mm-hmm. The cause of death was strangulation. This could have been any number of ways. Some suggest it could have been as simple as covering Mark's nose and mouth with a hand or hands or a bag placed over his head. They found a large wound on the back of Mark's head. They concluded this was from either from the car trunk slamming down on his head as he was thrown into the trunk of the car right. 
or it could have been from the killer striking Mark in the back of the head with a shotgun. This was violence that Mark had experienced in the first few hours of the abduction. Mark was sexually assaulted with an object. What object, we do not know. But this would be important so police could find, could they could possibly look for this item as they investigate the case. Mark was bound and likely for a good length of time. We know this because he had rope burns on his ankles and hands. Further digging, we find that it was determined that the binding marks on the wrist and ankles were believed to have been caused by an eighth or quarter inch bell telephone type wire. His body was bathed, his nails were cleaned and trimmed, and this leads to several questions, right, Captain? Mm -hmm. One, did Mark struggle with his abductor scratching him, leaving evidence under Mark's fingernails, and the killer then decided to clean and trim the nails? Was Mark bathed before or after he was killed? Did this killer tell Mark he was safe and taking him home, convincing Mark to bathe and put on his clean clothes to meet his parents after this nightmarish four days? These are all good questions that anyone who has studied this case has likely pondered. Right. You want the answers to these questions. Well, here you go. Well, if we have the shotgun attack on the back of the head, and they think that happened early in the abduction. Maybe is that how he got Mark into his car? If he's posing as a security guard or a police officer and he gets this young kid to turn around, put your hands on the car, crack him with your shotgun Mm -hmm. or a gun, and then put him in the vehicle. Well, let's provide a few answers to some of those questions, okay? Because this is reported just wrong and it has been reported wrong for 40 years. So why here's the truth. Okay. Mark was washed, cleaned, uh, clothes washed and cleaned. No evidence or mess was found. That has always been what was reported because of a report prepared by Lorne Doan of Springfield PD. The truth is, and this is taken from this week's recommended reading the kill jar. That on February 20th, 1976, evidence collected from the Mark Stebbins scene was received by Charlotte Day at the Michigan State Police Crime Lab and reported on March 2nd, 1976, as chronicled in that report on the body of Stebbins. His blue parka with blood stains on the hood. Mm-hmm. Blue jeans soiled with dirt and oil from the parking lot where he was found trace fibers of white wool, red wool, blue wool, and yellow or gold carpeting. One human hair whose source was other than Stebbins was found. Rodent hair and dog hair on all outerwear. An unknown source of decorative blue paint on Stebbins' left rubber boot. Urine and fecal stains in his underpants. Soil and perspiration stains on his t-shirt. Stebbins' red sweatshirt was stained with blood. Now, that's a completely different report than we found no evidence and the boy was washed and cleaned. His clothes were washed and cleaned. Right. Just if you're wondering, you shouldn't find any of that stuff after you wash clothes. Right. Right. Uh, Yeah. So a completely different report. Why? I think it has to do with several things here. Likely one, the mishandling of the body. Remember, we said that the body was sent to the police department before it went to the morgue. Right. The clothes were removed from the body before it went to the morgue. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing here that what you have is you have two different reports conducted by two different people at two different locations, and they each have different findings. One finds a messy body with evidence on it all over it. And the other finds a clean body with no evidence. Well, maybe one of them's processing the dummy. Well, what has always made its way to the media and to documentaries regarding this case, this 40-year-old unsolved mystery, is the clean version. That no evidence was found. That the body was cleaned. So for the next 10 months, Captain, the Southfield and Ferndale police investigated They called in the usual suspects. The registration of sex offenders would not start for another 20 years, but they would round up the local sex perverts and they were checked out. Yeah, you got to round up the local flicky flickies. But uh, the other thing here, though, is this, if you're going to 
if you're going to profile this suspect, having a clean victim washed and bathed and clothes clean, and now a dirty victim with dirty clothes, you would profile this killer differently. Mm -hmm. Oh, of course. I think the thing to hone in on is the the four days, the 96 hours that someone held Mark captive. So let's think about that. How do you hold a child for that long from the afternoon of Sunday, then all of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday morning? Can you go to work during that time? Can you do this by yourself or do you need someone's help? And where do you live that you can bring a child to your house without suspicion and hold them there for that many days? All right, we're back. Cheers, mates. Cheers, Captain. On Wednesday, December 22nd, 1976, 12-year-old sixth grader Jill Robinson and her mom agreed on one thing, that they had had enough of each other. They lived in Royal Oak, another town like Southfield and Ferndale. This is about 10 minutes from where Mark Stebbins' body was found. Jill's dad, Tom, had divorced the mother a few years earlier. Now, she had a long day already, and now she was rushing to get dinner on the table before going to church. Jill's mom asked Jill to make biscuits for dinner, and Jill was known as being a smart and stubborn girl. She was having a bad day, too. So Wednesdays are supposed to be the days that Jill would spend with her father. He would get her after school, and they would have the evening together. Well, Tom failed to get Jill on this Wednesday. No, surprise, surprise. And now she is stuck with her mom and sister for the night. Mm -hmm. Not exactly what she wanted. She was also not sleeping well lately because she was having this reoccurring nightmare. This nightmare was so concerning to Carol that Jill was seeing a psychiatrist to help, uh, help her through this problem. What was the dream about the nightmare that she was having? I don't know exactly what the nightmare was. But she's stating that it caused Jill to have fear that someone was going to shoot her to death, that she would be shot at some point in her life. Mm. Jill refused to help with the dinner, and an argument started between the two. Carol was at her breaking point, and she looked at her daughter, and she shouted, Get out, which was heard loud and clear. Jill grabbed her denim backpack, and she was going to take off. She filled filled the backpack with her hairbrush, a blue and green plaid blanket, some makeup, some underwear, and two books. No, so she's going to go live out on her own. Not exactly. The The first book is a first edition Little House on the Prairie book. This one had an inscription from a family member that gave it to her as a gift. The second book she checked out of the library, which was a Nancy Drew mystery. These books are very important clues. Now, Jill, before leaving, is going to put on winter clothes. It was below freezing outside. And as she was leaving, she told her younger sister that she was going to their father's house. She slammed the door behind her. Now, her father's home is approximately six miles away. Mm -hmm. So she grabbed her bike. She loved her bike. It was a high-speed brand, 20-inch frame, purple with chrome fenders. It had a white banana seat sounds like your bike she hopped on her bike and she was gone Mm -hmm. jill's mom waited an hour and went outside to look for her carol thought that she would find jill sitting out front of their house ready to apologize but when she got out there there was no sign of jill so carol called tom jill's father and when he told her that she wasn't there and he had not seen her carol called the police and reported her missing The police began searching. They checked if she had stopped at any stores and they interviewed a bunch of people. Jill was seen by a family friend at about 7.30 p.m. near the Tiny Tim Hobby Center. They didn't find anyone who saw her after this. Nothing. The police found nothing else until the next day. This is when the police found her bike in the 160 block of Washington Street. It was leaning against a tree. 
The police started searching the neighborhood when a local teenager came up to them and informed them that they had found the bike, he and his friends, somewhere else. And they had been out joyriding it through the area before leaving it at the tree. Mm -hmm. So the police went to 1523 North Main Street. This is where the boys said that they had originally found the bike. The address was for a building in a business area. The bike was found at the rear of the building, according to the boys. Now, this would be a concealed area behind the building, about a three quarters of a mile from Jill's home. It was in the direction that she would have traveled if she was en route to her father's house. I won't put too much emphasis on where the bike was found or where it could have been during the course of that day, because we now know all these years later that we have many reasons to believe that the bike was moved several times throughout the course of this time period before it was found by the police. Well, first of all, the police need to tell these kids, look what you did, you little jerk. Don't move a bike. It's not yours. That's stealing. Long days passed as everyone searched for Jill. Now, the day after Christmas, Sunday, December 26th, 1976, at 630 a.m., four days after her disappearance, a motorist driving northbound in Troy, Michigan, saw her body on the I-75 shoulder. He got on his CB radio and contacted the police. Mm -hmm. He reported this, but was gone by the time that the police had arrived. The police arrived to find a girl who was shot in the face and killed. It appeared she was shot point blank. The police reported a halo of crimson around her head. Jill's body was placed in the snow, fully clothed, with her backpack still on her. There was a light layer of snow on the body. This location was not shielded in any way. Anyone driving down the road could have witnessed this murder or the dumping of the body. In fact, Jill's body was within sight and sound of the Troy police station. No one at the police station heard or saw a thing, but there was a witness. The witness was driving his car on Highway I-75 at 3.30 in the morning when he spotted a 1971 Pontiac Le Mans idling on the highway shoulder. The witness slowed down and merged into the left lane as he approached the Le Mans. The Le Mans slowly pulled onto the road. The witness was adamant to the police that it was, in fact, a 1971 Le Mans because he had once owned the same vehicle, mm -hmm. similar vehicle. The witness offered up specific details regarding the vehicle. There were primer spots on the left side and a broken left taillight. Jill's body was transported to the morgue and an autopsy was performed. She was fully clothed. She still had her backpack on. The two books were missing. Her body was bathed and her nails were trimmed and clean. Jill had been, quote, cared for and fed during the four days that she was missing. Jill was also placed where she was found, not dumped or thrown. I think it's fair to say we have the right to question the last few items that we stated here. You know, we, we saw in the Mark Stebbins incident that one thing is reported mm -hmm. and another thing actually happened regarding the body. Yeah, if there's urine and feces, those clothes weren't washed. The cause of death was from a shotgun blast to her face mm -hmm. while she was lying on her back. So she was killed where she was found. She had died the same way that she had feared that she would, or at least what she had told her mom and the psychiatrist. Wait, go back to that. So you're you're claiming that they're stating that she was killed where she was left. Yes. But she, this eyewitness that saw the car leaving the scene did not hear anything. Did not hear anything. And, and, and there's also no other reports of hearing anything. Right. And like I said, the Troy Police Department is within an earshot. Yeah, shotgun blast. You're going to, there's going to be somebody reporting that. What well, what makes them believe this? If nobody heard it, then there's no one to report it. Mm -hmm. well, I'm just saying, what other evidence did they have to make it them think that the the actual death happened where? Well, where the victim was. Left? I had reported the crim the halo of crimson above her head. Mm -hmm. So that would be the the blood being blasted out of her. I mean, I can't put it. There's no nice way to right. put it. 
the blood being blasted out of her head as she was shot in the in the in the face with the shotgun. Mm-hmm. Uh, the crown of her. I was going to leave this out of the story, but uh, since pushed for an explanation, the top of her head was located there as well. Did they do an autopsy to find out if she, if there was strangulation at all? Um, look, it's the report is the same as with Mark and what we will see with the other two victims as well. The public, the public reports of these are not the actual findings, not the actual police findings. Right. And all of these situations we're going to be told. And at some point it became like almost like lore, like, like local legend. Right. That this mystery of a killer who's, who's so smart and so tactful that they decide, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to abduct children off of the streets. Um, and these are middle-class kids too. I'm going to take these kids and I'm going to keep them, do whatever I want. And I'm going to clean them, scrub them clean to the point where you can't find anything on me. Mm -hmm. You know, they want that. There's this portrayal of some kind of genius child killer that was stalking the area. And really, as we saw with the Mark Stebbins case, that wasn't the case. That's not how the body was found. It was right. But we see this a lot in the, the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s. And, and it's really just starting to turn over now where this idea of these genius killers and these genius serial killers, like if this guy was such a damn genius, then why is his tail light busted? You know what I mean? If in fact that was the car that dumped the body or right. placed her there and then shot her there. Right. But again, here's a, a here's folklore taking over going, uh, not, this guy's an evil genius and he grabs these victims and he cleans them up. And you'll never catch him. You brought up a great question though. Was there any sign of possible strangulation? I believe that there was. And, and I have n- not much to base this off of at all, but my, here's what my suspicion is. She was laid on her back and her backpack was found on her. I think that somebody, one of two things possibly happened. I think that this individual that was dumping her body there on the side of the highway took the shotgun along with them for two reasons. One, in case they needed it to use it on the victim. And two, if they needed it for protection of themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay. So picture this, he's walking, he or they are carrying the body of of a girl that they have already strangled that they believe to have been dead right and they're going to put her in the snow place her off the side of the highway and then get back in the car and drive on right mm-hmm. now i think one of two things happened they laid her down da- they laid her down on her back and they said that her backpack was found still on her back so i think that either a she wasn't actually dead. And when they placed her on the ground, she came to and <gasps> took a breath and it mm-hmm. scared them. And they shot her there and then, or she was in fact dead. They placed her down. And because of the backpack, it may have made the cause the body to move in a way or even push out air from the lungs where they would have the same reaction. They would think maybe she was still alive and react the same way using the shotgun there and then. Okay, you want to know the fact? What's that? You want to know the fact, Jack? <clears throat> that came out a little hairier than I thought it would. Here's the fact, Jack. This is what I believe. I believe, like you said, perfectly, is that she was strangled before. She was strangled at this suspect's house she was dead. She was in this person's possession for four days. What was the biggest thing going on in her life? Or one of the biggest things going on in her, her life? She's th- seeing a therapist about these nightmares of being shot and killed. And I think she was dead. And I think this killer went out of his way to bring a gun to shoot her in the face as a sign to the parents. as uh, at, Like, I got to know her. And th- that's what I believe. Right. I think this person, her, I think this killer knew about these dreams and, and thought they were clever in some way. Well, and I think that goes with the profiling as well. We're, we're not talking, uh, you know, let's stop calling these people evil geniuses. 
but this person does have some intelligence and they do have some thought process on what's happening. And what's interesting here is you have one body that's found in the fetal position and one body that's found face up, right, with the Mm -hmm. book bag on. And I wonder if that's some kind of clue that they're trying to leave because they took their time to put these bodies and they're wide open spaces, right? Mm -hmm. But they're taking their time to almost place the body. That's there's some thought process or possibly again, that could just be the way that it's reported. What we learned with the first murder is you can't, we can't trust the reports on the Mark Stebbins case. So I don't know that we can trust all of the, you know, it, it, it almost looks to me more like Mark was just dumped. Not not really placed with a whole lot of thought. And it right, could be right. a, and it could just be reported that way. Oh well he was found kinda in the fetal position. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think I here's the one thing that we cannot uh dispute. You know, you gotta look for actual scientific fact in these things. And so what we're going to go ahead and talk about here is we the the layer of snow that was on Jill mm-hmm. is going to tell us what time she was approximately killed. Because it, it didn't start snowing until about 3 a.m. that night. Okay, so they would, they would determine that she was killed between 3 and 6 a.m. That helps us out a little bit. Scientific mm-hmm. fact. We know about what time it started to snow. Well, we know, not killed possibly, but we know when the body was left in that spot. Correct, correct. Um, there was no sign of sexual abuse found with Jill. Um, some, uh, so the cause of death, uh, lack of sexual assault, different gender, different victim gender, and the location was enough to keep these two murders unrelated as far as police are concerned, at least for the moment. So now captain, what we have is we have police from four different agencies working these cases, Troy police. Royal Oak police. They are working the Jill Robinson case while Ferndale and Southfield are working the Mark Stebbins case. Now again, gut your gut feeling here is does this person know? Does the suspect know? Does the killer know that they're leaving them in different areas uh, under different jurisdictions? It's possible. It's very possible. It could also be possible that the victims were victims of opportunity for the killer. Uh, that they went out trolling around looking for somebody walking alone Mm -hmm. and that's who they took and presumably did the same thing when it came time to dump the body. I'll drive around and look for a spot where nobody is. And if it happens to be out in the open, then boom, I got to park my car and get this thing on the side of the road very quickly. Well, there's another two victims. So I think that's going to lead us down more of a funnel. A week after Jill's body was found, Christine Mihalik vanished. She was a 10-year-old fifth grader who lived in Berkeley, Michigan, another Detroit suburb. On the day of her disappearance, Christine was helping her mom around the house. She already had run an errand for her mom that required her to cross 12 Mile. This is considered to be a busy street to most. So Christine asked her mom if she could run to the 7-Eleven across 12 Mile. She'd love to paper her walls with the pictures from the hottest teen magazines. Mm. The new teen superstar magazine had just come out and she wanted to pick up this issue. Who do you think was on the cover? Uh, this was Donnie and Marie Osmond. Mm. Were That's on what, the cover. That was going to be my guess. Her mom had trouble saying no to Christine. She didn't really want her to go, but she had already sent her off on an errand for herself mm-hmm. across this busy road. And so now it's going to be tough to say no to her. So she lets her go to go pick up this magazine. She even gave her $2 so that she could pay for it. Now it was around 27 degrees that day. So she put on her baby blue ski jacket over a white blouse and gray jeans. It's about a five minute walk for her. When Christine was not back in an hour, her mom started to panic. She contacted the police and Christine's father. The police checked with the clerk at the 7-Eleven and found out that Christine made it to the 7-Eleven store and, in fact, had purchased the magazine. This would be around 3 p.m. So the search for her began immediately after finding out that she had made it to the store but not returned home. Mm -hmm. It was a full-on search. 
The parents hit the streets looking for her. Uh, her father, he was he was out on the streets with his gun in his belt looking for his daughter. We had two missing children that showed up dead. The police were stopping cars and investigating every possible lead. The neighbors of the Mihalics started collecting money in case of a ransom demand. The total was up to $17,000 in just a couple of days. The parents and grandparents went on TV begging to whoever to allow Christine to come home. The search and the media attention stayed strong for 19 days. For the 19 days that Christine was missing. Let's emphasize that one more time. 19 days. Over two weeks, almost three weeks. Mm -hmm. Jerry Wozni, an 11-year-old veteran of the Postal Service, was following the same route that he did every day when he saw tracks leading about six feet off of Bruce Lane. There he spotted what he thought was just a blue blanket. As he approached this and got closer, he noticed that a hand and knees were sticking out from it. Terrified, he jumped in his mail truck and he went to the closest police station. Wozni told the police that the body was snow-covered except for a hand and her knees sticking out. Christine's father received a call at work from a reporter. Nice that that's how you get notified about your daughter's body being found. Her father drove through a blizzard to the state police station in Pontiac, Michigan. He arrived in time to see his little girl's frozen body lying on the metal autopsy table. And then did he punch somebody in their freaking face for not letting him know? He did not. He After have. defrosting, the coroner was able to perform the autopsy. She was dressed in the clothes that she was kidnapped in. They had been cleaned and pressed like the other two victims. She was recently bathed and her fingernails had been cleaned and trimmed. The cause of death was suffocation. There were no signs of sexual assault or blunt force trauma. They ruled that she had been killed within 24 hours of the discovery. That means that she was alive for at least 18 of the 19 days that she was missing. There was one thing noticed about Christine's clothing that the parents of the other children did not mention. Christine's mom was adamant that Christine did not dress herself the way that her body was found. She cites two reasons. One, her pants were tucked into her boots and two, her blouse was tied in front instead of in back or may have been put on backwards. Right. These are two signs that might at least in this case show that the killer dressed the victim after death. There was evidence left at this scene. Tire and footprints were found in the snow. With the discovery of Christine's body, a task force was formed. Authorities announced that they believe the children were murdered by the same person. The task force will investigate the three murders and the possibility of a serial killer. The task force was made up of law enforcement from 13 communities and led by the Michigan State Police. The Detroit News offered up a 1,000, I'm sorry, Captain, a $100,000 reward Mm -hmm. for the killer's apprehension. And local stations aggressively covered the case. The Michigan State Police and the police departments where the children were last seen or the bodies were found received a federal grant to help pursue the investigation. Oakland County was on high alert. Police were giving classes at schools on how to stay away from strangers and how to escape if someone tries to grab them. Yeah, old stranger danger. Parents were not allowing their kids to walk by themselves. There was a safe house program established where participants would be screened and then allowed to put a safe house placard in their front window. If a child felt that they were in danger, they would be able to run to one of these houses for help. Fathers sat down with their children and told them to be careful and steer clear of stranger dangers lurking in the nearby areas. This is what Barry King did with his son, Timothy. On Wednesday, March 16th, 1977, Tim King, a straight A student, he's a sixth grader at Adams Elementary School, Mm -hmm. went out to play around on his skateboard. It was chilly, but not freezing. Tim was small for his age at four foot three inches and only 63 pounds. Tim and his family lived in Birmingham, Michigan. This was a, it's a little bit nicer than the other towns that we've already discussed but not rich by any means. Mm. 
Tim's father, Barry, was a lawyer, and on this night, he had to meet with a client. Since he needed a witness, he convinced Tim's mom to come with him. Tim has always been the responsible type. He even recently took on a paper route, but his parents were worried about him being out on his route. So Tim was spending the night at home with his brothers and his sister. Throughout the evening, they each got called away. His sister Kathy was getting ready to to leave when Tim asked to borrow 30 cents so he could buy some candy at the local pharmacy. She lent him the change and left to meet her friends. Tim ended up alone for the night. At about 8.15 p.m., wearing a red nylon shirt, dark green Levi corduroy pants, and white sneakers, Tim headed out and he arrived at the pharmacy on Maple Road at about 8.30. Tim left the pharmacy through the rear door that led to the parking lot, which is where he would typically ride his skateboard. Tim's parents were eating at the diner across the street. This is at Peabody's Restaurant. After dinner, Tim's parents went home, arriving around 9 p.m. They immediately contacted the police once they realized Tim was not home. Police suspected this to be the act of the serial killer that they were looking for, and they wasted no time searching for the boy and spreading his story. An intensive search was executed that covered the entire Detroit metropolitan area, and there was widespread media coverage. In an emotional television appeal, Timothy's father, Barry King, begged the abductor to release his son unharmed. In a letter printed in the Detroit News, Tim's mother wrote that she hoped Timothy would come home soon so she could serve him his favorite meal, Kentucky Fried Chicken. A tip came in from a woman claiming she had seen a boy with a skateboard talking to a man in the parking lot of the drugstore that Tim had been to. The woman described the man as white with a dark complexion and around 25 to 35 years of age. He had shaggy hair and sideburns and had been driving a blue AMC Gremlin with a white stripe on its sides. So we got two two cars now. This Gremlin was seen during the evening Tim went missing by his brother. A composite sketch of the man was released all over the area. Authorities questioned everybody in Oakland County who owned a Gremlin. This is a good move right here, Captain. They they got a county-wide search warrant. Mm -hmm. So officers could randomly pull over vehicles to search for Tim King. A lot of effort was made here, but sadly in the late evening hours of March 22nd, 1977, two teenagers spotted Tim's body in a shallow ditch alongside Gill road in Livonia. This is across the County line in Wayne County. Mm -hmm. His skateboard was placed next to his body. Again, it has been reported that Tim was found like the others, his clothing neatly pressed and washed. He had been tied up, sexually assaulted with an object, and suffocated. The postmortem showed that Timothy had fried chicken before he was killed and that he was suffocated approximately six hours before his body was found. The Oakland County Child Killer Task Force reportedly investigated over 18,000 tips. But when the federal grant money ran out in December of 1978, the task force was formally disbanded. As of 2012 reports, the case file has accrued 20,000 tips, 500,000 pages of documentation, thousands of interviews, and hundreds of pieces of evidence. Yet to this day, no one has been convicted of the murders of Mark Stebbins, Jill Robinson, Christine Mihalik, and Timothy King. However, the investigations continued. The victims' families have refused to let these child murders be forgotten. They have formed their own task force, conducted their own investigations, and from that came theories. The theories put together in the last 15 years are far more plausible than the theories worked by investigators in the late 70s. We believe that now we are closer than ever to solving these murders, and tomorrow, we will explore the mother of all theories in the continued search for the Oakland County child killer.
I want to thank you guys so much for listening. Thanks so much for sharing on social media. If you'd like to hear the, us talk about the update on the Aurora Hammer Slayer murders, you can check us out on stitcherpremium.com slash truecrimegarage and use promo code garage and you can get a month for free. So check us out on Stitcher Premium. Until tomorrow, everybody be good, be kind, and don't litter.